We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this week in the church year is from Deuteronomy chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I will let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him as they, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. This is the word of the Lord. He was so close but he didn't quite make it. His whole life had been focused on this single task, guiding the people of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. He narrowly missed death after his birth, but he grew up as a prince. He seemed destined to die in obscurity in the desert, just another Bedouin, until God made his purpose clear. Lead my people out of Egypt. And so he endured their complaints and rebellions. He suffered with them for 40 years in the wilderness. That generation came so close to receiving the land promised long ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they didn't quite make it. They perished as if right at the end of an ancient Near Eastern ultra marathon. But Moses moved on with the second heat. He addressed the next generation as they stood poised to receive the prize, and he reminded them how hard the course had been. They had fallen, but God had raised them up. It was close, but they, by God's grace, would make it into the land. But the speaker, the great champion of the race, with eyes as yet undimmed and strength as yet untapped, would not be able to power his way into the land. In the heat of competition, he, yes, even he, had been disqualified. There were gasps and tears and fear began to fill every heart. How could it be? He was so close. He had led them so far. But now he would die on a mountain. So close, but you didn't quite make it. Our lives have these moments too, don't they? Perhaps not as dramatic or as drawn out of that as that of Moses, but we too work hard and we're excited to find a sense of purpose and direction, even a divine calling or vocation. Not everyone recognizes what that is in their life, by the way. And so if you do, count yourself blessed. Yes, this is it. I found it. This is what I'm going to dedicate myself to. I'm going to completely invest myself in it. Sometimes we seem to see our future laid out before us as if whispered to us from above, you cannot fail. And yet we do. We stumble in the race. We get lost in the wilderness. Though we regain our sense of purpose and persevere, it's sometimes just too late. Our GPA won't be high enough to enter the program. It was close but not high enough. Your audition or your interview was good. You've never prepared for anything quite as much as that. 
It was very good, nearly good enough, but not quite. Your relationship has been going well. Things are just amazing. How much you share, how much you have in common, you think that maybe she's the one. She's studying to be a deaconess. You're in the pre-sem program, but somehow things just don't seem to work out. She graduates and moves on, and you do too. You thought she was the one. It was close, but it didn't quite work out. The details of an obituary are sobering. Even if sometimes we have to read between the lines. The breaches in relationship that were never reconciled shown when a father does not attend his son's wedding or a daughter her own mother's funeral. The career paths that were not successful, the bankruptcies or the failed business, the obvious lack of mission in life, a life just frittered away on one game after another. History is an unfriendly judge. The brilliant and courageous career of Moses all seems to crumble with his death. Not just his death, but a death outside the land. As if his whole life is stamped with the bold letters, failure and his file is cast into the trash. Moses, it seems by God in our text, is forced to confront his failure. God says, this is the land that I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, but as for you, you may not enter it. And then the text says, Moses died. He was judged, not just by history, but by God. And it doesn't get any more tragic and sobering than that. Yet an obituary or any record of our lives based on what our eyes see is inadequate. There is a hiddenness to our lives which only God can know and sometimes God chooses to reveal. Only God knows, our text reminds us, where Moses is buried. For God, the text implies, is the very one who buried him. God was there at the end. He heard the last words of Moses, and he even knew his last thoughts. That which even Scripture in Deuteronomy does not reveal to us. But the author of Hebrews writes about Old Testament believers that, he says, these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Moses may appear to many to have been the ultimate failure, but in fact, he welcomed the promises of God from afar. There were still greater horizons than even Mount Pisgah, our Old Testament mountain, could offer. He realized that he was heir of a promise far greater and more enduring than even the land of Canaan. For him, and for all whom God calls, there is a heavenly, hand, heavenly land. And perhaps even losing all that seems to be of value and worth in this life sometimes sharpens our spirits on the heavenly horizon. Loss, disappointment, even failure can crush our spirits and even cause us to lose our way. But they can, as tools in God's hands, Focus us on a more excellent way, a path that leads to more enduring goods. What we lose in such experiences of loss is often, if not always, precisely nothing of value in comparison to the joy and peace and far more that God showers even in this life. As we begin this week, the deserts and mountains of Moses' obituary fade into the background and new but similar landscapes appear before our eyes. A desert and a mountain. In the desert, Jesus competes against Satan in a spiritual wrestling match of the highest stakes, the salvation of mankind. But like, unlike so many ancient Israelites, unlike Moses himself, and unlike any since Adam, Jesus emerged from the desert unscathed, hungry, but still spiritually healthy. He struggled not for himself, but for you. And importantly, he won. Success followed Jesus in whatever he did, as the crowds comment in the Gospels, Mark chapter 7, verse 37. He has done all things well. But there were those from his family, 
and then from his own disciples who didn't understand his path. They didn't perceive his mission. His siblings urged him to greater publicity as if to make him more popular. And even Peter tried to make Jesus to keep him from his mission. Like Moses, Jesus was appointed for a mission. His whole life was given over to it. He was the Messiah, the anointed king, the leader of God's people. The descendant of David come to take his throne. And he was so close. Now he approached Jerusalem. Finally, many urged him on. He was, he was approaching his destiny. He was nearing his goal. He was reaching his potential. Until all turned tragic. And in the matter of the week, his career was over. He was so close to fulfilling the expectations of many, to achieving his potential, but he took it too far for many, criticized those whom none dared cross, and found himself on a Roman cross. Hanging there from the mountain outside Jerusalem, suffocating and bleeding profusely, it was as if Jesus was forced to look on what he was unable to attain, his rightful place as messianic king, the true culmination of his glorious mission, that to which he had dedicated his entire life. He was so close, but he didn't make it, many thought. He must not be the one. What a tragic end to the life of Jesus. What a devastating obituary to read. Messianic hopes failed. He died a criminal's death. Rather than being exalted, he was disbelieved and dishonored. That's all our eyes could see, failing though they were. And so the history of many and the opinion of many have it inscribed. But they're wrong. They've totally misinterpreted, miswritten, and misbelieved. For the truth of this man's death was hidden. He wasn't compelled to that mountain like Moses to look upon what he could not have. He chose to go. He did not deserve to be hung on the pole like one who is cursed but he consented. No one who beats the devil in the desert must be martyred on the mountain. No, he went a far greater champion than Moses by far, and one who competed for us. He came to win for us what lies on the other side of the mountain, what no eye has seen and no ear has heard. That heavenly country with milk and honey blessed, and he did. For this man has no obituary, for he left it in the grave. His victory over the mountain was greater than that even in the desert. His death was not hidden, but neither was his resurrection, for he appeared to many. There's no mystery about this man's grave, for he has no grave. Don't go looking for him, for he has already found you. He's the one who picks you up when you fall. He's the one who cheers you from the sideline when the race seems long and your strength all but gone. He's the one who comforts you when you fail, who forgives you when you sin, who turns your defeat into victory, and he's the one who reminds you, for he knows far better than anyone else, that what seems to be your final tragic mistake can yet be your greatest hour, regardless of what your obituary may one day read. For since he climbed that mountain and out of the grave, there is great praise and joy for us, waiting for us in the high country, just beyond the hills. In the name of Jesus, amen.